Hey everybody, good afternoon and welcome back to The Atheist Experience. I'm Martin, that's David. How you doing? Uh, this show is sponsored by Atheist Community of Austin, a nonprofit educational organization promoting positive atheism and separation of church and state. And I just want to make sure my mic's okay. Seems all right. Uh, this, uh, we are live of February the 18th. That is correct. Okay. I think. Yeah. All right. 18th. 20th. No, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. Wait a minute. 17th. 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 Yeah. <laughs> I'm just so off. Uh, February the 17th, 2002. This show is sponsored by Atheist Community of Austin, a nonprofit educational organization promoting positive atheism and the separation of church and state. ACA holds weekly meetings every Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m. at Hot Jumbo Bagels at 307 West 5th Street, downtown between Guadalupe and Lavaca on 5th Street. It's about a block west of Antones, except for the first Sunday of each month when we have our lecture series at First Cafeteria at North Cross Mall. There's a brunch and starts at 11 o'clock. It's all kinds of fun. Our next lecture will be March uh, the 3rd, I do believe. Um... Godless Gamers is a, a spin-off group of ACA, uh, meets every uh, Monday night at 7 o'clock p.m. at the home of Jeff D. and Manda. For more information on that, uh, please talk to Jeff or Manda, or you can go to the ACA website and join the Atheist-Gamers mailing list. ACA Happy Hour is a, a little get-together on Wednesday evenings at about 7.30 p.m. at Antonio's Tex-Mex, uh, which is near the intersection of I-35 and Highway 183. It's a fun little evening get-together for the folks who find it difficult to make the Sunday morning meetings. Um, let's see. So for more information on the ACA, uh, you may visit our fine website at atheist-community.org, or you can call our voicemail at 371-2911. The Nonprofits is a weekly internet radio program sponsored by ACA, hosted by Jeff D., and featuring Vic Farrow and Mary McManamy, and it plays at 2 o'clock in the afternoon on every Saturday at the atheistnetwork.com website, and your web browser will need the uh, Real Player plugin, I believe. Yeah, the Real Player plugin in order to hear the audio stream, and there is a live chat room feature that you can use to interact with the hosts of the program. It's all kinds of fun. Um, atheist, speaking of nonprofits, and Atheist Experience and Nonprofits Archives... Uh, on uh, CD-ROM, ooh, we've got a live camera there that we're zooming in on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, on CD-ROM have been prepared by our uh, Ashley Perrion, uh, one of our crew members here, and we would like to thank him for his efforts on that. Um, Atheist Experience, both uh, the audio tracks from the Atheist Experience television show, as well as the nonprofit's internet radio show, are uh, featured on these in uh, both QuickTime and MP3 format. And again, thanks to Ashley for. Uh, his excellent work in 20... This is the January 2002 disc. For more information on uh, these uh, CD-ROMs, uh, you may send an email to atheist at mac.com, and you can find out more about uh, what, these, uh, what the CDs are all about. Okay, so without uh, further uh, just uh, hemming and hawing, let's get on over to David for today's news. Oh, well, we have lots of different snor uh, news stories we can choose from. Okay. Let's start with Bob Jones University. Ha-ha, <laughs> those guys, yeah. Bob Jones University hopes to lure minorities and erase its racist image. Uh -uh. Bob Jones University, the fundamentalist Christian school that banned interracial dating until two years ago, is recruiting minorities in hopes of shaking its racist image. And more than 40 minority students have applied for aid through two new funds that are sponsored by private donations. Okay. The university first admitted black students after the IRS moved to revoke its tax-exempt status in... 1970. 1970. How yeah, progressive they are. Socially yeah. progressive right here. Wow, my goodness. I uh, just thought that this was interesting. They didn't uh, get rid of their uh, ban on interracial dating until after George Bush, who was campaigning for president, uh, stopped and spoke at the university and the media really criticized them. Yeah. And only then did, did they decide to go ahead and do this. That's right. Only after being embarrassed in publicly did they right. lift their ban on interracial dating. Right. And, and, and there was another really interesting uh, related news about oh, okay. Bob Jones University. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll just read straight from the, the newswire. Oh, oh, all right. Fine. Uh, Bob Jones University President Bob Jones III uh. said that with the release of the new government document, the Emancipation Proclamation, <laughs> which he stated was being looked over by university lawyers to determine exactly how much of the proclamation the university would be legally compelled to comply with, mm -hmm. that the university 
would take the socially progressive action of actually paying the school's minority staff. The staff consists of groundskeepers, cooks, and janitorial crew, and would be paid, quote, at least a fraction of the current minimum wage. Ah. Uh, you smart guy. You made that I up. I made that up. Oh, All right. Okay. All right. Anyway. Ah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Had me fooled there for a second. I, yeah. Well, with Bob Jones University, it wouldn't be surprising. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a website uh, put together by a, uh, a Bob Jones uh, alum who has since seen through the, you know, horrors of what he was involved in. He's got a website called nobojo.com. <laughs> <laughs> and where he talks about, and it's hysterically hilarious, and where he talks about, uh, you know, the, the, his experiences there, and also has sort of up-to-date news on all kinds of wacky stuff uh, going on uh, at, uh, at the university, and uh, both past and present, and it's a very amusing site. Uh, if you can check it out, it's uh, nobojo.com. Oh. I'm trying to get Russell to put a link to it up on our links page, but I'll definitely uh, I'll have to check so that have out. To, have to bug him about that because it's funny stuff. Well, we have two news stories about um, uh, okay. the Ten Commandments judge, Roy Moore, the Alabama Supreme Court. Uh, okay, is he the guy who like w- snuck the thing in there in the middle of the night when nobody was watching except for his hired camera crew from a fundamentalist Christian yes, doctor, production company? Doc- yeah. Uh, yes, Dr. Apparently, Dr. James Kennedy, who uh-huh. runs Coral Ridge Ministries, which is a, a big mega church. That's okay, uh, right. Uh, so, Judge Moore snuck his monument in the rotunda of the mm-hmm. Capitol building, apparently, mm-hmm. at like midnight, and did not allow uh, the, the the regular news media to come film it, even though they tried. Mm-hmm. Instead, he allowed James Kennedy to bring his cameras in. Then, obviously, once all the the big uh, you know hubbub happened, hey, you know this is unconstitutional. Uh, James Kennedy now sells these videotapes exclusively given to him. My Judge Moore sells them for 19 bucks or something like that, or whatever, and whatever amount. He just sells them, and then he gives the money to Judge Moore to uh, pay his legal costs. You know, you know how helpful the FBI would find it if serial killers went around with a camcorder, <laughs> filming all their murders, <laughs> be great. and then and then selling them on the internet. You well, know, it would. You know, just making them making a having a, a, a distinct record of their law breaking activities. Well, it says here so James Kennedy has launched a campaign to raise $200,000 for the legal defense of Alabama Chief Justice Roy Moore, okay. who's been sued for erecting the, the monuments. Yeah. Uh, Moore gave Kennedy's TV crew exclusive access. <laughs> Kennedy also plans to host a cruise to Alaska with Moore from August 26th to September 2nd. Oops. On Holland America's cruise ship Volendam, the tour will offer gorgeous Alaskan scenery, rich biblical teaching from Dr. Kennedy, insight into America's Christian heritage from Chief Justice Moore, as well as superb onboard entertainment for an elaborate cost. S- superb onboard entertainment. Yes. Uh, okay. Kennedy's website said that Moore's legal expenses are mounting. Quote, fees for travel, lodging, expert witnesses, and court recorders will quickly drive up the cost for Chief Justice Moore to defend the right to acknowledge God in public life. Well, he can, Judge Moore can acknowledge God all he wants as a private citizen, okay? But he cannot, under the Constitution, as a public servant, allow his position as as a government employee to be something that he uses to proselytize or endorse his religion. That is clearly unconstitutional, okay? Oh, is so DJ, and, GD, and now we're being told by the control room that D. James Kennedy is the guy who is responsible for this kind of, kind of ridiculous film was that the, played over the holiday season. Was it the Christmas Carol or something? Yeah. But, but it, from a, a, uh, a slant of this is how the world would be yeah, without... Yeah, Scrooge is this ACLU lawyer, yeah. right, whose like, entire life is devoted to... A complete caricature, obviously. Demolishing religion in all its forms because he's so evil. <laughs> okay. And... Uh, and and this played on like TBN over the Christmas season, and, and then and then it took the formula of but well I don't know if it, it it adapted or attempted to adapt. It was it seemed like this sort of weird mix of it's a Wonderful Life and a Christmas Carol, but brought in with this of course from a, a fundy proselytizing yeah. point of view, and it was just uh, you know great fun I'm sure to watch spectacular ways to celluloid. Well, there's a, been a lot of. Uh, problems brought up with, first of all, apparently okay. for Alabama, it's illegal for a public official to use their position to help others make, help others profit from it, such as by mm. allowing Kennedy uh, exclusive oh. rights to film what he did in the public rotunda and Man. then sell it. 
Okay. And then now he's doing this cruise. Wow. There's all, I mean, it's just like wow. lots of intertwinement <laughs> here. And then another news story about uh, Justice Moore. Oh, there's more. There's more. There's more, more. The you Alabama of more. Supreme Court decided Friday that a heterosexual father is better suited to raise three children than their homosexual mother, with Chief Justice Roy Moore adding that homosexuality should not be tolerated. Now, if... Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, let, let me. Okay, let me go on. Uh, a quote from Justice Moore: No matter how much society appears to change, the law on this subject has remained steadfast from the earliest history of the law, and that law is and must be our law today. The common law designates homosexuality as an inherent evil, and if a person openly engages in such a practice, that fact alone would render him or her an unfit parent. Uh, then yeah. this, this is, that's just pure hate speech is yes. all it is. The, the, now, now, I, know, I, this is Austin, right? So you don't, I don't, in, unless you are just a dyed in the wool fundy, you don't really, it's hard to live in this town and not know a few gay people, right? Okay. I've got gay and lesbian friends. They're wonderful folks. Um, most of them that I know of are, you know, terrific role models and, you know, for children and, uh, you know, they're very good in terms of, Exhibiting the same, no different sort of parental skills and the ability to, uh, you know, to teach and to be good role models for kids as, as any other heterosexual couple. And in fact, I know one straight couple in town, okay, uh, who are, um, they're nice folks, okay, but, and they're theists, all right, but they like, you know, they smoke doob in front of their kids all the time, <laughs> right? You know, which is not, so what is the guideline that he is using? I mean, well, there's this assumption. I don't know. I don't know if there's the assumption that homosexuals are more likely to be pedophiles than straight people, but um, crime statistics put the light to that. I think the overwhelming majority of pedo- males. pedophiles are heterosexual males, and not only that, they tend to be either, in most cases, family members or either close friends of mm-hmm. the family of right. the child that they're yes. molesting, i.e. priests. We have this mm-hmm. epidemic now. Oh, God, it's just... Yeah. I think there's something on the order of 70 priests in this country alone who are currently under investigation for um, for pedophilia and uh, and and child rape. Terrifying. Yeah. Okay. Well, Moore says here that the effect of such a lifestyle upon children must not be ignored, and the lifestyle should never be tolerated. Uh, he also said homosexual conduct is and has been considered abhorrent, immoral, detestable, a crime against nature, and a violation of the laws of nature and of nature's God, upon which this nation and our laws are predicated. Okay. Um, I want to know if he think, thinks it's okay to just take them out and kill well, them. But this, wait, 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 wait a minute. I want to know if he thinks it's okay <laughs> well, to just I, I take think them that out he does. and kill them. I think he does. Because but, but that's another... what the Bible says to do with homosexuals. Yes. Is you just take them out and you kill them. Yeah. So I want to know if he thinks if he that's really, okay. He should. I mean, he he doesn't seem to bother sharing his opinion on this. It sounds like. But he there's have a another with it. aspect of this case that I think is even more disturbing. Yeah. The case involved a divorced couple with three children. The father had held custody since 1996, but the mother petitioned for custody, contending the father had been abusive. A Jefferson County. She whiz. A Jefferson County Circuit judge ruled for the father, but the Alabama Court of Appeals ruled four to one for the mother. The appeals court said the father had a history of calling the mother vulgar names in front of the children and of hitting the children. The appeals court said there was no indication the mother's homosexual relationship would be detrimental to the children. So what you have here is Roy Moore saying, I think uh, a loving homosexual parent is a is worse, worse than, than an abusive parent. An abusive and, heterosexual and, parent. And I've got to tell you, I, I grew up with an abusive father, and I would much rather have had a loving homosexual parent <laughs> any day of the week. Or loving any kind. Uh, I, I, yeah. think, I think if anything but, happens to these children, mm-hmm. Judge Moore a, and the rest of the court uh, but, uh, should, be, responsibility. should bear responsibility for that. Well, we'll see what happens. Okay, now... However you might personally feel about, you know, if, if you find homosexuality tasteful or distasteful or whatever, okay, fact of the matter is, okay, there's all kinds of things in life that individual peoples are, are, are going to be offended by, okay, but, you know, it, it is a case of, you know, okay, for example, I think that, um, you know, people who practice all kinds of weird, kooky religious beliefs, Okay, are not exactly the most sound people that right. I, you know, people who believe, you know, that uh, they've been abducted by UFOs or what have you. I mean, it seems to me that there are all sorts of belief systems and or quote unquote lifestyles that a person could adopt um, 
But whether, but that does not necessarily have any bearing upon how you might conduct your business in other real life situations. Now, in many cases it might, right? I think that the kookier you tend to be, okay, but I think that time has borne out and shown that, you know, apart from having a sexual preference for the same gender, okay, there is nothing about that that makes a person innately different in their essential, their socialization, just the way they behave in their job situation, uh, in their normal social interactions, or as a potential parent to a child, okay? You know, so in, in fact, so you're much less likely than somebody who might adopt some strange belief system and think that, you know, we're all, you know, there's some guy who's walking around with tinfoil on his head to catch all of the <laughs> rays from space or something. You know, there, there are a lot worse things out there, a lot stranger things out there, but those don't seem to be, uh, you know, causing so much of a problem because the Bible makes a hot button topic out of homosexuality right. all the way back to Leviticus in the Old Testament and guys like him um, would rather uh, stay tied to that. It's yeah. really kind of. I'm yeah, sorry. Well, I'm well, rambling about it's, it. It's, it's it's just. I, I could see. I could sit here and speculate all yeah. day about why people adopt hate speech and hate attitudes, and we'd get nowhere. Well, speaking of that, uh, this, the Boy Scouts have put out a oh yeah uh, an actual like a, a proclamation, basically mm-hmm. saying this is it's the first time they've ever done this. They've had it in the rules that say homosexuals and atheists cannot be leaders or members. You know, if they yeah. if they come out. Um, of the Boy Scouts, okay. but this is the first time they actually came out with like a proclamation that said, "No, we don't think it's good, and it's not moral, and they can't provide the leadership that children need." Mm-hmm. Uh, Peter La Barbera of the Culture and Family Institute with Concerned Women for America said, "You've got the homosexual lobby, you've got liberal scout leaders in various liberal cities trying to pressure them to change the policy. This is a good sign that they are not caving in." Parents are obviously worried about pedophilia, and so I think the grassroots are supporting the Boy Scouts. But statistics show that that again, is, well, one, that are just yeah, the crimes. The, the heterosexual Boy Scout leaders are much more likely statistically to. I would say if you're a parent who is obviously worried about pedophilia, don't go to a Catholic church. That's what I'd say. <laughs> okay. Well, Bob. Now, Knight. But, but then, but then, but I would be wrong to say that. I would be as wrong to say that as they are wrong to say what they're saying because. You know, just as not all Catholic priests are these pedophile child molesters, right? Okay. Clearly, if there are any gay child molesters out there in the world, and I'm sure that they exist, right? Okay, you don't condemn an entire group, okay, for however one or two or three particular instances of a situation. Look, pedophilia is a crime, okay, whether or not it's being perpetrated by a gay person or a straight person, right? right? It's a horrible, you know, immoral violation, and it, legally, it's a crime. So if somebody's out there doing criminal stuff, then they're a criminal and you need to be hitting them for that. Okay. And, but to just to assume, oh, well, you know, everybody who has uh, red hair parted to the side, okay, uh, is, or, or everybody who likes to eat beets, you know, isn't, it doesn't belong in our group because they wouldn't, you know, I mean, it's, it's an arbitrary distinction. Right. It's not really based on anything. Right. You're just using that as your justification to be bigoted against this particular group, whether it's people who eat beets or people who are, you know, gay or lesbian. Well, Bob Knight of the Culture and Family Institute said it is more important to protect boys from homosexuality and to stand up for God than it is to stand for political correctness. Now, I've got to say that I, the Boy Scouts have gone to court to win the right to be a private organization that discriminates. Mm -hmm. If they want to ban homosexuals and atheists from their groups, I am perfectly fine with that, if, but they should not be getting public, public funds. funds, which they do in just about every city in the United yeah. States that has a scout troop. If they were a private group, and if they were to maybe exhibit a little truth in advertising and call themselves the Christian heterosexual Boy Scouts of America, right, that's right. then fine. Then yeah. go about your business. But that's we've great. got we have government legislators in yeah. Congress and the Senate trying to pass bills bending over backwards to protect this private discriminatory group, mm-hmm. and I'd like to know why. Uh, I'm not saying that the Boy Scouts can't discriminate. If they're a private group, they can't. But if they're getting a lot of public funds, then no. Yeah. Can't. Well, anyway. Uh, <coughs> and the last bit of news comes from the Institute for Creation Research. <laughs> okay. Uh, from their website, uh, which is uh, www.icr.org. Right, right. Uh, somebody asked a question on their website about a particular verse in the Bible, Genesis 6-4, that says, There were giants in the earth in those days. 
and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them. Mm -hmm. So somebody was saying, well, what is it, what is it with these giants? What are these giants? As I understand it, the the sons of God, the angels coming to earth to have sex with earth women. Right now, uh, what the ICR says is that it is rightly noted that the term sons of God in the Old Testament refers only to angels. Thus, these must be fallen angels. But angels in scripture are spiritual beings having no permanent body. So let me suggest another alternative from our modern day understanding of genomics, one which Bible scholars of yesteryear could not have suggested. Are you ready for this? Yeah, I'm this ready. is their explanation, ICR's explanation. Okay. Now they grant degrees, I'll have you know. Oh yes, yeah. They from, grant uh, mm-hmm. actual degrees in like a- geophysics and astro. Sure. In any event, I'll give whatever according to the ICR, yeah. the inner workings of the DNA molecule would not have been hidden from the prying eyes of Satan and his henchmen. <laughs> It gets better. It gets better. If today animal genes can be inserted into human DNA, Ah. could not have been accomplished by malevolent spiritual beings bent on destruction of the image of God. At the very least, Satan's demons, in their lab coats I imagine, could have selected (laughs) and indwelt certain men and women and performed selective breeding experiments to produce over the generations a race of giants. (laughs) Wait, 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 wait. Okay. Demons are on Earth doing what, eugenics? D- DNA and sp- experimentation. Okay. Yeah, so way back when. Ah, all right. Um, ah, uh, okay. Which, of course, has been proven in the fossil record by the well-preserved demonic laboratory yeah. that we found. Uh, is, so <laughs> then it talks about other... <laughs> then it talks about animal fossils. Yeah, okay. Satan could have done the same with animals, too, and maybe that's oh. where some of the unthinkable features we see in the fossil record come from. This could represent Satan's rage. You mean you mean all that stuff that's actually older than six thousand years? Yes, unthinkable. Was ah. what, it was DNA, uh, you know, uh, formed. This could represent Satan's rage in trying to fully destroy any vestige of God's once very good creation. So, like the Tyrannosaurus Rex, this terrible, horrible lizard, was obviously not a good animal. So, therefore, it was probably created by DNA experimentation by Satan and his demons. Um, uh. So, you know, we don't have to have. <laughs> We don't, we don't have to have any of those questions anymore. That's okay. explained. But wait, now. Okay, now I know Catholics would think this, but isn't it heretical to, to view Satan as a creator? Isn't that heresy? Well, now, you, and now you, you've had the training. You went to a Christian college. Now. But they're saying that Satan is not creating. Satan is changing what God made. Satan is, is rearranging, but not creating. And God is allowing Satan to do this because... Uh, well... I don't know. I guess maybe he wasn't why, noticing. Why, what, what? I mean, God's like, hmm, look at those dinosaur-looking things. What are those? Yeah. Who, who's making that thing down there? Man. Yeah. Uh, so, so <laughs> Satan is not creating. Okay. He's rearranging. Oh, these Institute for Creation Research people want this drivel, okay, about Satan and his little imps doing eugenical genetic experiments on lizards to make dinosaurs, taught in school as though it were some form of legitimate science. Okay. Well, his answer also to why the moon has so many craters, impact craters, ah. was that it's quite possible that the Bible refers to this when talking about angels and demons having war in heaven. So the, the apparently so they they're were body like, slamming they're each body other. slamming each other. Or throwing and things each at each one other. Makes a big... And making craters. And, and all this you can get from their website and all kind of... I mean, so this is their scientific... What makes craters on the so, moon? So there was WCW in my, back in the in, prehistoric... In ICRs... Yeah. Apparently, yeah. scientific uh, 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 explanation for the craters on the moon, it's war between angels and demons. You know, it used to be thought, okay, okay people, would take, people would view as proof of the existence of fairies, okay, that the reason your food would spoil overnight if you left it out was because fairies were the little things that came out of the other world and messed with your food if you left food out. Okay, for too long and your food went rotten. It was because the fairies had gotten to it. Okay. Now, later on, we discovered things like vitamins, okay, and, and, and the properties of food, and, and, and we discovered these ideas. Okay, and then we really knew how it all worked. So there's no need for fairies anymore, okay? Folks, we know why there are craters on the moon, okay? We have a fossil record to explain why, uh, you know, we have, you know, entire, entire scientific fields paleontology, biology, you know, ar- archaeology, um, taxonomy. <laughs> we, we have explanation for why there is all of this stuff going on on the earth and in the moon and around space, okay? We don't need to evoke fairies or angels or demons having fistfights on the moon making craters, 
Okay. Well, I think that's that, just <laughs> delusional. Well, we that's can, beyond we can see delusional. That obviously this is this is published on their website and in in their own books. But okay. I think the fact that it has not been put out in any peer-reviewed journals probably says. Enough. Well, because peer <laughs> peer-reviewed journals would like send it back. With you know yeah, skid marks be, on it, that'd be part saying of the this is what we think of that. But that'd be part of the conspiracy. Well, sure, you know, our, right. our humanistic conspiracy, which it would make you think they would want to do it that way anyway, uh, so they could play that victim of the conspiracy card. But anyway, yes. anyway, just this is the year two thousand two. Let's get rid of all of this dreck, okay? And let's just look at the natural world the way it is, okay? We have the ability to do that. Huh. Anyway, speaking of. And I know that we've got good, um, kind of, can we actually take the phone number down for a few minutes, Russell? Because we want to get into, uh, I know that we're about, oh, we're close to half an hour into the program, but I do want to talk about, since we are close to, on, close to this topic, uh, the creation evolution debate that took place at the UT campus on Friday night. Uh, and we'll try to, we do want to talk about this in detail, so we will probably end up taking some fewer callers than we do on an average program. That's unusual, but today we just have this uh, topic to discuss. And then as soon as we're done with that, we'll get on to the calls. So if you want to hold, that's fine, whatever. But uh, on Friday evening at 6.30 p.m., uh, there was a creation evolution debate uh, on the UT campus in uh, building UTC, uh, 2112A. Uh, it was sponsored by a student organization called uh, Helping Austin Area Schools. And uh, some of the co-sponsors were, among others, uh, Campus Crusade for Christ, or a co-sponsor of it. And... Uh, uh, there were, of course, two speakers being a debate. The speaker for uh, the intelligent design argument um, was a guy named Kirk Durston. And Kirk Durston is... Can we maybe go back to the main camera? I don't want to have to look off to my left. I just want to sit here and talk regularly. Thanks. All right. Perfect. Uh, don't want to, don't mean to be directing my producer, but I know. Now I, I can't. Mean, yeah. Okay. Unless you wanted to run off to the restroom or something. No, no. Okay. All right. Anyway... Uh, <laughs> Anyway, Kirk Durston, who is uh, affiliated with uh, a group called New Scholar Society, and, uh, and the uh, speaker for evolution was a guy named Sah Dr. Sahotra, Sahotra Sarkar, Sahotra Sarkar, who is a professor at UT. Uh, his degrees are in the philosophy of science, and he's done some work in biology. Um, but it started out where um, Kirk Durston, the ID guy, had... Oh, there we go. We can move the camera back and forth. The ID guy had about uh, 20 minutes to state his case. Uh, Dr. Sarkar followed up with 20 minutes, followed by Durston, 10 minutes, Sarkar, 10 minutes, and then five minutes for a concluding statement from Durston and Sarkar. Then there was a break, and then uh, there were four UT professors who uh, each asked questions. questions right? Each had one question, and then they took some Q&A from the audience where we had to write our questions on pieces of paper as specifically for one of the two uh, debate participants, and then they would ask them. And what was interesting, this is the first time I've ever been to any, any, this sort of live debate. Okay. And, and it was interesting for me because what I, the transcripts that I've read of past debates and the way I've read that these debates have, uh, have been done in the past with other guys, like I've read about how Dwayne Gish, who is a mm -hmm. creationist, debates his debating style, although I understand now he's retired from the debate circuit. Um, is you do get this kind of, you know, throwing everything against the wall approach and seeing what sticks. And we didn't really get that with Kirk Durston. He had some very specific points that he was trying to make. Um, but his argument, I thought, very quickly unraveled itself because what, he, what his argument was based upon for intelligent design was rooted in this mathematical equation from a field of mathematics called uh, information theory. Mm -hmm in which he talks about uh, an information theory. Uh, it was the brainchild of a fellow named Claude Elwood Shannon. And so uh, Durston was referencing Shannon as well as this, I think, at least one, if no more than two other papers as his main sources throughout. Yes, yeah, so Kimura, um, I think, a Japanese. No, I think Kimura was, uh, was uh, one of Dr. Sarkar's oh, okay. references. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, but uh, I think maybe if one of our attendees uh, will call up or uh, refresh my memory on those names. Um, but he just kept going back and forth between these one or two papers and Shannon's information theory. And this one equation that he used in order to assert that um, under information theory, it was impossible for any system uh, or any, any organism, or we'll just say any system, to contain 
uh, over 70 bits of what he referred to as functional information and, 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 be, pro- and, and be produced simply in nature through natural causes. Now, apparently he had this benchmark of 70 based upon the fact that one concession intelligent design has made to evolution is that they have gone ahead and conceded that what they call microevolution, mm-hmm. which is mutations within species, does happen. Right. And there's pretty much no way they couldn't concede that because genetically, and I mean, that's indisputable. Okay. Um, but what ID guys uh, want to put forth is this idea that um, evolution, and particularly evolution through natural selection, is inadequate to explain what they refer to as macroevolution. Or, as Durston very stupidly put it, how do you get from a sponge to a chicken? Right. Okay. So, which is, you know, a, a complete misunderstanding of how the whole process works in the first place. And Dr. Sarkar would try to point that I out. I think you do that by going from household goods to poultry when you get in the store. Yeah. You just sort of, you know, right. that's on, okay, that one's on 9A and that one's on 11B. Okay. Right. <laughs> but uh, anyway, now... I'm not a mathematician by any stretch of the imagination. And what was interesting... And I'm even less of yeah, one. And, and, and interestingly, and it was interesting to me that what, what Durston had, we, we had his laptop set up to this PowerPoint projector thing, and he had this very impressive looking slideshow, you know, with all of his points delineated, that he was flying through very, lickety very split. Yeah. And which, lit, which gave me the sneaking suspicion that he was just trying to pound us with all of this math very quickly in order to sort of impress the audience with, ooh, look at all this math. And I'll just kind of trust that he knows what he's talking right. about because he was not, he was not staying on points long enough for you to kind of process it. Okay. Right. And, it, and it, when he brought up the numbers, it was kind of like, okay, well, we'll assume this, then move on. Yeah. You know, he was stating. So was, he stated that uh, his premise as though it were this axiom. Okay. That were just self-evidently true. You cannot get systems in nature of seventy bits of information or higher. Anything bigger than that requires an intelligent designer. Okay. But he never then went on to establish, first off, what he meant by functional information as opposed to non-functional information. And he never really demonstrated that you cannot get just yeah, through never, natural processes. I never saw that. As yeah, I mean, did, did I just doze off and miss uh, that? Or I, did, I didn't see the foundation for the, the claim of the 70 bits to begin with, yeah. necessarily. Well, I think what he used as his benchmark for that was he talked about a hypothetical transmission from space. Okay. Ah, uh, the 21 bits of info. Or, or, uh, 20, 21 20 prime numbers in prime sequence. Numbers, yeah. Okay. Now, first off, how it is that 20 prime numbers in sequence is functional? You know, I don't really know. I mean, that's a point Jeff D brought up. It's like, well, how, wh- what makes just that functional in information anyway? But Durston's argument was that if, you, if, if we were to receive this radio signal from space and it consisted of the first 20 prime numbers in sequence, it would be reasonable to conclude that it would, that the probability of that just you know, coming up, right. okay, is vanishingly small. And so it would be reasonable to conclude that that transmission had intelligent origin. Well, I, immediately I wanted to kind of know why, you know, t- why would we be any less inclined to think that a transmission from space with 17 or 13 or 11 or 9 or 6 of the prime numbers in sequence would have any less right. of an intelligent origin than 20? I never really understood his benchmark for 20. And I think that that's where he, that's where he put it because below that he was getting to, to points where he could not apply the his, 70. his theory to, you know, to anything on the ma- microevolutionary scale right. and, and be able to stick with his mathematical equation mm-hmm. like he wanted. But the problem is, you know, again, as you know, Jeff and I, we were talking after the, the whole thing and it's like one of Jeff's questions that he wrote down on, um, and, you know, my question that I wrote down on, on my little slip of paper, which didn't get asked, was, you know, you have not established that this is impossible, that it is impossible for nature to produce systems of over 70 bits of information on its own. And, um, and again, and I don't under, ex- explain why seven, and I don't understand why 70 is your benchmark in the first place. You know, it was a com- purely arbitrary number that he applied. Mm-hmm. Okay. But... Beyond that, just to sort of, you know, not go on for hours and hours about this, where it all kind of fell apart for me was not only in that he was not describing what he meant by the difference between functional and non-functional information, and uh, he did not justify his use of that mathematical equation, okay, 
And in fact, and my sneaking suspicion that his use of that equation in the context of biology was inappropriate, that was confirmed when Dr. Sargo came out in his rebuttal and said, this type of math is irrelevant to biological systems. This is not how you apply this right. kind of equation. And not only that, but Durston, in his use of that equation, was like creatively omitting this one variable. According to Dr. Sargar, Durston immediately said, no, I'm not. I've got the complete equation here. And then at that point, but not putting up his PowerPoint slide, you know, so which I thought was a little suspicious. But anyway, but where it all fell apart for me was at the tail end, like I said, they had this Q&A session where the audience could submit our questions. And f for the most part, the questions were really disappointing because I don't know who was picking them, but they were picking a lot of real softball questions. Yeah, I thought so too. Overall. Until at the very end, uh, Jeff D's question actually got uh, got asked because they, they ended up only pretty pick, picking three questions Just for each guy. Yeah, it was not very many. Yeah. And Jeff D's question was the last question asked of, of Kirk Durston, and that was, how many bits of functional information by your formula would it take to come up with the intelligent designer you are proposing? Right. And where would that information have originated? Right. Yeah. And Durston wouldn't go there. He refused to address it. He basically said, I don't have to explain that. Right. <laughs> and he drew this completely off-the-wall analogy to, like, my grandmother doesn't understand how a laptop computer is or, built. Or how, that, yeah, how the cyclotron works or whatever. Yeah, but, but that doesn't mean that laptop computers weren't built. And I immediately wanted to scream out, yes, but I'm sure that your grandmother knows people exist. Right. Okay? And that laptop computers are, at the very least, made in factories by factory employees who are homo sapiens. Right. Okay. I mean, so that was an utterly off the wall. Well, and he, he what he was doing was saying <laughs> evolution must explain this many bits of information, but I don't have to explain the bits of information in my designer. Yeah. Uh, he was, and, you know, and, uh, he, ref he refused to apply the premise for, of his argument for an intelligent right. designer. He denied his own premise the, by doing that. To the intelligent designer he was trying to propose. Yes. And at that point, the whole house of cards just came tumbling down for me. Because at, it, it, became, it was very obvious then that his whole thing was just, um, it, well, it boiled down to just the, the, the same two arguments that you get from traditional Christian teleology, 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 and uh, basic Christian apologetics, which is you have um, the argument from incredulity. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, which is... <laughs> I don't understand that. I don't, I don't understand how this could possibly work unless we invoke my designer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or, and it was, in the end, it was God of the gaps with a bunch of math attached to it yes. to look all scientific-y, mm -hmm. okay? But it, ultimately, that's what it was, God of the gaps. He said, you know, science is good at explaining this bit and this bit and this bit and this bit, but it can't explain this. And so this is where we have to insert intelligent design. It's just God of the gaps all over again. But he would not address the question, uh, because by his own premise, okay, and he admitted that any any intelligent design creative force, okay, I mean, this stuff rolls downhill, okay? Uh, stuff can only be designed by something more complex than it is. Right. Okay. Um, and a person is still far more complex than even the, the biggest computer in the world, all right? So that follows. And, and so he admitted that, Durston admitted that, but then by his own premise, his intelligent designer must contain more bits of functional information than anything that he could produce. Than the entire universe. Right, right, because if he produced it all, yeah. or I mean, it produced it all. Every single bit of functional information, in the, the grand total of all of that in the entirety of the universe, his intelligent designer would have had to have contained more than that. Mm -hmm. and, right. and he kept bringing up that the problem with evolution was all this unexplained information uh -huh. And yet he posited... He posits something... Uh, uh, the most unexplained information yeah. of he all. He posits <laughs> an, a, a, a potentially infinite amount of unexplained information. Yes. And then so he his, doesn't have to explain that. So his, his conclusion refuted his premise. And there was a, also a, a, a... One of the scientists that was asking the questions also brought up, I'm a scientist and I don't see uh, the falsifiability in, right. in there, and he didn't answer. He didn't really answer. Well, what that. he what he he answered it by saying, "Well, it would be falsifiable if we could find more. If we could find any sort of naturally yeah, evolving over seventy over that was right. over his magic number, <laughs> yes. right? And and it disappointed me because the professor kind of let it go at that point. And I wanted the professor to hardball him at that point and say, "Yes, but can you apply like as 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 the example that Jeff D noted? Mm -hmm. 
I bet you if you applied his his little formula to you know the mac- the microevolutional processes that led to tigers and whatever tigers right. were before they were tigers, you know who's to say that it wouldn't go higher than seventy? Yeah. He didn't. It was his job to provide that evidence. Mm-hmm. Okay, and he didn't do it. He just stated his little formula as if it were this inviolable axiom. Okay, and then moved on. Um, and what I thought Dr. Sarkar did that was brilliant was he said, look, of course you can get these kinds of very high number of information, you know, the, the, this, this stuff happened in, in natural causes. You know, you can, it, and the example that he gave was, you know, you take a pack of cards, okay, and just deal it out at random, or everybody pull out a random number of cards, and the odds that you get of getting that particular order you know, of cards that you got are, are, are just as high. Are, are as high or even higher than the odds he was that Durston mm. was saying that you could not get naturally developing complex organisms. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then there was that also that very funny little bit, and I thought Dr. Sarkar's presentation had a lot of more wit going for it than Durston's because Durston was dead serious the whole time. And Dr. Sarkar put up this news <laughs> transparency of a news item. Of something that happened in, uh, there's like a rugby match in Africa. So I think so. something where this bolt of lightning struck the field, killing all of the members of one team, and sparing all the members of the other team. And you know, some people standing by were like, "Oh, well, that must have been witchcraft or something." But I mean, come on. I mean, what are the odds? Eleven people. Yeah, eleven people. All all eleven guys on one team spared all eleven guys on the other team. Um, but just say, I mean, the odds of that are astronomical. Yeah, I mean, just weird. <laughs> but yet, highly improbable things happen every day. <laughs> yeah, well, this yeah. it's it's a basic misunderstanding that happens among uh, creation theorists and create and intelligent design guys, and uh, is that there is a, I think they they misapply probability or they misunderstand probability because as Dr. Sarkar pointed out, look, what you're not taking into account when you apply this equation is just how much stuff is going on. Okay, so like. like um, this would apply if, if, like, he was talking about one set of events happening in sequence or something. Mm-hmm. But you actually can take into account there's the vastness of the universe, even just the world, the, the Earth, how big that is. How many events are simultaneously taking place? Okay. How many reactions at the same time? Let's say chemical reactions. Yeah. Uh, all over the place at the same time. Every second of every day. Right. Every nano, every half second of every day. Every then you have these billions and trillions yeah. and, you know... And uh, uh, with the number of events, the, the sheer number of events that are taking place, not and not that's just on the Earth, on a universal scale, okay, then suddenly a number, like the number that he came up, which I think was 3.3 times 10 to the negative 141st or something, yeah. which was his level of improbability of life evolving just through natural processes. But suddenly a number like that isn't all that impressive. Okay, when you're talking about a, a, a near infinity of events taking place, mm. I mean, obviously the universe is finite, but the number is... Staggering. So large, you just can, can't fit it all into your brain, right. okay, even if you wanted to. So there's that misunderstanding. But mainly for me, where it fell apart with Durston was when he refused to apply the premise of his argument to his conclusion. So no, right. I mean, it all just kind of, he, he just sort of negated himself at that point. Now, to be fair, just to make sure that we're not too one-sided on this, I thought Dr. Sarkar made a couple of important flubs that he shouldn't have made, and that was on a couple of occasions he repeatedly mentioned uh, how you have, we have observed macroevolutionary proce- macro processes taking place in a laboratory scenario. To which the obvious creationist retort is, well, yeah, but that's in a lab. With and, intelligent design. And you've got intelligent design, i.e. you guys, controlling the experiments. So he should have realized that that was the retort and, and made his argument differently in that, in that regard. But overall, it was a very enjoyable evening. It's very stimulating. Um... Got into some heated discussion afterward with a guy, um, uh, but it was, uh, but it just got, went to show that when you get right down to it, um, creationism and especially intelligent design, which is this is this attempt to wrap creationism around, you know, up in mathematics and formulae, you know, just does not have the scientific street cred that it wants because when it, you get right down to the nitty gritty, it all is. Durston didn't establish anything. Mm. No. I mean, he did not explain anything with his theorem. All, all, it was all focused on attacking current evolution science and then evoking his god of the gaps. Well, there's this stuff, and you evolution guys can't explain it. So my intelligent designer, therefore, gets to be introduced. 
you know, that, which, that was which, what course, it all boiled down to. offers no explanatory power in and of itself. Yeah. I mean, it's just God of the gaps mm-hmm. all over. It's God of the gaps with math, you know, and with math thrown at you so fast that knowing that the majority of the folks in this audience aren't going to be instructed in that mathematics, you know, hoping to sort of wow you with the presentation of it all. But, um, but this is what, and now here's a little something that's interesting, and I'm just going to go over this very quickly before we go on to take our callers, because we have some callers up. And, They've and, been very patient. We appreciate that. Yeah, thanks that. a lot. And we're, we're halfway through the show now, so we do want to get to our calls. But today was a special event, you know, talking about the debate, and, and we needed to address it. Um, this is a printout. This is uh, some text from a webpage uh, called antievolution.org, which is a creationist webpage. And... Um, they and in it they delineate their strategy, okay, for exa- exactly what it is they want to accomplish, and this is something called the wedge strategy, and um, it is very important that people out there, particularly proponents of good science education, uh, our good education period, know what is going on here because there is a definite agenda, and the governing. I, I'm not going to read you from the long bit, okay, but basically this is a group of uh, fundamentalist Christians uh, who are, I guess, biblical literalists. And, um, well, I'll just read this opening statement because it is such a perversion of (laughs) history. It's Okay, the proposition that human beings are created in the image of God is one of the bedrock principles on which Western civilization was built. Its influence can be detected in most, if not all, of the West's greatest achievements, including representative democracy, human (laughs) rights, free enterprise, and progress in the arts and sciences. (laughs) Folks... This is the greatest perversion of history it is possible to make, okay? Ask Giordano Bruno, who was the astronomer who 400 years ago was burned alive for suggesting that the little pinpoints of light you see in the sky were probably other suns like our sun, and those little suns might have planets around it like our planet, and the church murdered him for that. Ask his, you know, John Ed- get John Edward on the phone and find out if he thinks that constitutes progress in the arts and sciences, okay, it, it is appalling to suggest that, that uh, religion, and particularly the establishment of Christianity, has been a friend to science in any way. It is appalling to say that. Um, but you know, I don't want to get too heated on that. But, of course, um, but here is their goal. This is what they want to do. Okay, they have governing goals, and then they have their five-year plan. Does that sound familiar? Hmm. They have their five-year plan, which, incidentally, they're not up to speed on because, according to Russell, who printed this out for me, all of this was come up with about 1995-96. Okay. They have their governing goals, and then they have their five-year goals and 20-year goals. But their governing goals, now listen to this carefully. Okay. Their governing goals, number one, is to defeat scientific materialism and its destructive moral, cultural, and political legacies. Okay, I want to repeat that just so you understand (laughs) the magnitude of what's going on. To defeat scientific materialism and its destructive moral, cultural, and political legacies. Okay. Now, granted, scientific discoveries are things that, like anything else, can be misused, right? Okay. Just because science was used to create the atomic bomb, okay, does not discount the fact that science is what also came up with the polio vaccine, okay? It does not discount what happened, that the very computer these idiots wrote this crap on is a result mm-hmm. of, you know, scientific materialism. The fact that the lifespan of the average American male today is in the 70s, whereas 100 years ago it was in the mid-40s, is all due to advances in science, okay? Now, this attitude that scientific materialism has destructive consequences, okay, is very reminiscent of an attitude that existed almost exactly 100 years ago in Western Europe, okay? What happened was there was this move towards spiritualism, and the occult in Western Europe in the, towards the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th centuries as a reaction against the Industrial Revolution. Because what happened where you had cities basically developing slums and becoming all polluted with factories and stuff like that. And, you know, granted, that you know, not a good thing, but there was a backlash against what was perceived as this sort of materialism by these groups of folks who and got into all sorts of nature work, whether it, it took the form of just nudism and people frolicking in the, you know, the lakes and ponds or the, the Danube or the whatever, all the way to very, very bizarre spiritualist and supernatural ideas. And one of these supernatural ideas was something called ph- theosophy. 
okay, which came up with the concept of the seven root races of man. Okay, this was written by some woman who was this nutball called Madame Helena Blavatsky, who claimed to have gone to Tibet and co- commuted with all these, you know, I see them, <laughs> deal, all right? Um, thank you. Uh, they claimed to have gotten all of this spiritual knowledge. Okay, now these ideas, theosophy is what we got the concept of the Aryan from. You see where I'm going with mm-hmm. this? Okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so again, so these, th- when you have this kind of um, blanket rejection of science uh, and this claim that science has destructive moral and cultural political legacies, I think we know exactly what sort of moral and cultural political destruction took place around about the late 30s, early 40s. Okay. And this was very much rooted in occultism, it was very much rooted in this idea of racial hygiene that was brought upon by the idea of the seven root races of man and the Aryans were this pure race, okay, and and the, all these, uh, any non-Aryan race was subhuman, and we got that. Now, I don't mean to suggest that uh, these guys are Nazis in disguise, but it's the same kind of thinking, okay. But anyway, um, now here are the five-year goals, which they have not met. To see intelligent design theory as an accepted alternative in the sciences and scientific research being done from the perspective of design theory. Hasn't happened. Why not? Because intelligent design theory ain't a theory. I thought it was because of a conspiracy in the scientific community. Oh, right. I keep forgetting. Okay. Yeah. All because we're all evil subhumans. Okay. To see the beginning of the influence of design theory in spheres other than natural science. Okay. I don't even need, know what they mean by that. And, uh, but that doesn't seem to have happened. And then to see major new debates in education, life issues, legal, and personal responsibility pushed to the front of the national agenda. Well, they're trying to do that. They're trying to have these debates, but still, in every single instance where intelligent design or creationism has been brought up as an, in an attempt to sort of infiltrate school boards with it, it has been shot down for the clear reason that intelligent design, there is nothing scientific about simply saying, we don't think your idea works. Right. You know, and because... It, it, this idea that if we discredit current scientific ideas... It makes our theory correct. Yeah, that, that <laughs> somehow by default proves our beliefs. That's not how you do science. So anyway, and the 20-year goals, well, you know, they want to see intelligent design theory as the dominant perspective in science, and uh, pigs will fly. Uh, that's about it. So I'm pretty much done with my little spiel on that. Um, and... Uh, do you, do you have anything to no. say about the debate? Or? Uh, I think you said it pretty succinctly there. Okay, do we want to go ahead and... <laughs> all these guys on the phone have cauliflower ear, I know, but I told Russell at the beginning, you know, that uh, we were going to talk about this in some debate, so in some so, depth. So, so, so should we go to the callers? Let's the very, go to the, the callers now. patient callers. Let's go to the callers now and see what they have to say about this. David? Hey. Hi, thanks for holding on the phone so darn long. Uh, no problem. Man. How's it going? I enjoy watching your show. I have seen it several times. So I was just curious how you feel about the Pledge of Allegiance with the word God. Um, well, the word God, as you might know, was added into the Pledge of Allegiance at in the year 1954 as a reaction to McCarthyism. Uh, there was the Red Scare going on, and uh, Joe McCarthy, you know, was doing his whole thing of basically ruining people's lives by uh, branding them communists. And a, a, a religious uh, lobbying organization had the phrase under God inserted, basically exploiting the cultural and, and political climate of the day. The original text of the, the uh, Pledge of Allegiance is as follows. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty, justice, and equality for all. That was the, that was the pre-1954 text of the pledge, and, I've, and I'd like to see our country go back to that because that's inclusive and not divisive, as our current pledge is. How do you feel about the Declaration of Independence? Well, the de- and, and, and what, I mean, can you explain? Well, in the fact that uh, it uses the word God as well as Creator. Well, it, it, uh, first of all, I think that the, it, it does indeed use those, but, uh, and it's, a, it's an important document, uh, I think, in history, but also uh, our nation is not founded on the Declaration of Independence. Our nation is founded by the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, which is where they actually sat down, had a convention, and said, this is how we want our government to, to run. And the Constitution, the only time it mention, mentions religion is in a, an exclusion or exclusionary manner, mm-hmm. where it says you will not do this for religion. Uh, it, it does not yeah. give the government any authority religion-wise. So uh, I'm, you know, I, I think that the Declaration of Independence is important in history, but when they actually got right down to making our government, 
They said, we want it done this way. Well, do you feel that we ought to take out the word creator and God in the Declaration of Independence? No. Well, the Declaration of Independence doesn't really have any basis in our current lawmaking you know, procedures and current legislation. It's not, what is, it's not the document that's referred to. Uh, so, I mean, as a historical document, no, I mean, I don't see any point in taking it out any more than I see any point in, uh, you know, painting earrings on the Mona Lisa. You know, I mean, it's a historical document, and so for the purposes of history, you know, I mean, it ought to remain as it, uh, you know, as it was written. Well, what about on our currency and coinage it has in God we trust? No, I, 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 well, I usually take a marks a lot and cross that out, but... Well, but, you know, <laughs> you realize that that's not our original <laughs> national motto. Yeah. I'm sorry? The, in God We Trust is not our original national motto. The national motto put forth by, the original national motto put forth by some of our founding fathers was E Pluribus Unum, and in 1955 it was changed to In God We Trust, and now people today who have a, a very short uh, concept of history well, say that In God We Trust goes to, back to, shows our Christian heritage. Although I think that In God We Trust has been on our money for some time. Yeah, that's before. correct. It, it has in different yeah. forms. I mean, but, even going back to the 19th century. But in terms of correct. being our actual national motto, it is relatively new. What Apparently, uh, in 1955, they decided that our founding father's national motto was not good enough for America. So. Okay. Well, uh, you know, I was hearing you guys talk about, I guess, uh, you know, the creator and the creation debate that you guys, I guess, went to. Mm -hmm. But uh, I noticed something I thought was interesting, and uh, I was reading it in a, a book the other day, and it uh, talked about a person walking along the beach. And if they oh had, dear. Okay. You, I'm sorry. You know, I don't mean to. I don't you know mean to say. I don't mean to. I yes. What you're what you're what you're about to advance. It's called the watchmaker argument. No, it's not a watchmaker. It, it, you walk along the beach, and you would see um, uh, basically, you know, like David loves Martin. And uh, watching it, the sand or something? Yeah, in or? the sand. And so you look at that, and so, you say, well... Well, we do. Yeah, well, yeah. And so what, what is the probability of something like that happening? I mean, any logical person can look at that and say, oh, well, that one created by the ocean and the water's washing up and back. A hundred times out of a hundred times, you will come to the conclusion that that was done by a creator. Yes, it's the watchmaker. But ba yeah, so that's the watchmaker theory. Okay, my first question is, the watch looks designed to you compared to what? Wait a minute, what are you talking about a watch? I was uh, talking about the... Uh, whatever, the whatever item you find, whatever gizmo, whatever thing you find in the sand that was clearly put there deliberately by a creative intelligence, uh, it looks designed to you compared to what? What is your frame of reference for logic. being able to determine... Logic. But why, but why would logic be any less... Uh, I don't understand. I, what I, here's what I'm trying to get at. D give me your concept of what something that is not designed would look like. Well, I'm not sure if I understand your question. Okay, I mean, here's, here's the point I'm trying to make. This is something real simple. A little no. child could walk up and see this. But here's the point I'm trying to make. Okay. In order to have a concept of design, okay, you have to, I mean, like any other concept, you have to know what you're talking about. You have to have a frame of reference. Like if you walk into a room and the room is cold, how do you know the room is cold? Because you have a concept of what it is to be not cold. Okay. You have a concept of warmth or heat, right? Okay. So, in order to be able to look at some item like this hairbrush and say, this was designed compared to what? What is my frame of reference? In other words, what is my concept of non-design that I can look at and say, compared to that, this appears to have been intelligently designed. Okay. And that's what I'm asking you oh, is, okay, yeah. what's your frame of reference? My, my frame of reference then in that context would be if I walked up and I looked down at the beach and I, I just didn't see it at all. It would be just a normal beach. So in other words, the beach was not designed. I'm not sure if that is the conclusion. That's what you just said. You no, said, if I, I looked at the beach and there was nothing on it, then I would, uh, just a normal beach, that was what you just said, then the beach, by your own statement, unless I utterly misunderstood you, was not designed. No, no, no you're missing the point. There, there's, there's someone had written into the sand, okay, an inscription, okay? Okay, but what, if there's so no writing work. in the sand, if, but, there's, if there's no writing in the sand, if there's no wristwatch or hairbrush laying in the sand, okay? Then there's, no, there's nothing for me to even make a determination that something uh, that was put there. So the beach was not designed. Not the beach, because nothing's out of place in my frame of reference. Everything is just as it seems. But when I see something that is something different and from the frame of reference, 
which is actually the inscription, okay. then I, I draw the logical conclusion a hundred times out of a hundred times that that was done by a designer. Well, what you're, what you're saying is it, you're already assuming it. You're saying that anything you see must be designed. Yeah, it sounds like you're assuming your conclusion at this point. Well, no, you can actually draw that conclusion. I think you just did that. No, but the, the, the saying, point I'm trying to make is, okay, let's say you're just walking on the beach and you look down and all you see is the sand on the beach. Right. So what does that tell you about the beach? Well, it doesn't tell me anything. It just tells me... It's why not? Why, why couldn't you look down at the patterns, uh, get down there with a magnifying glass and look at the patterns of sand and be just as justified in saying, oh, well, that looks designed to me. But you're saying you can't say that about the beach just by looking at a beach and seeing nothing on it. Well, actually, you know, I feel that you can look out at the beach or at the sun, sunset or at the earth and you can see design in order. And How? By, 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 by what standards? What are you comparing a sunset to? to say that this sunset was designed versus X, which was not designed. Uh, what is your frame of reference? Again. It's, it's the order in design. No, 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 no. What is your concept of a non-designed thing? That's what I'm trying to get you to understand. A non-designed thing. See, I don't, I don't know of a concept of a non-designed thing. So if you don't have a frame of reference Everything, to use to determine design, you cannot make a distinction either way. That's not true. Well, I'm My afraid it is. My conclusion is very simple, that everything no. is designed by a creator. And because you're... Very based simple. upon what? Based upon nothing by your own admission. You don't have a frame of reference based to define logic. I mean, define it's non no. It's based upon your desire for there to be a creator. That's no. a different thing. No. Okay? There is if you have no frame of reference, if you can't look at this thing over here and say, that wasn't designed, and looking at that, I can tell that this looks different than that, therefore this thing must have been designed. If you don't have a non designed thing to compare it to then you cannot make a distinction either way between design versus non-design. Just like if you never experienced warmth or heat in your life, you would not really have a word for cold. Okay, You would not have any reason to distinguish cold from anything else. So cold to you wouldn't be its own unique concept. Do you understand? It would just be what things were. Okay, That's the point of, that I'm trying to make, is that you need to have a frame of reference in order to be able to say this is designed Versus well, see, this I, other I thing agree. that's not designed. You know, I, I just don't agree with okay. that. Okay, well, you know, you're afraid I don't agree. You have to have a sense of non-design. Well, you do. You, you have to. That there is a design. Well, you do. In, in order to know what you're talking about in any sort of subject, you have to have a frame of reference to draw upon. That's my whole point. Anyway, thanks for your call. We got to go to the next folks. We appreciate it. Take care. All right. Yeah, just uh, another case of uh, right, get, earnest, but just wasn't really getting it. Okay. Jerry on three. Jerry on three has been holding from a million years. We'll uh, put him on. Jerry? Yeah. Hey, poor guy. I guess you, got, guess you have really bad cauliflower ear now. <laughs> waiting for, <laughs> waiting right. for us. Anyway, thanks for your call and thanks for holding. What can we do for you? Well, uh, first off, before I get into what I wanted to address, is just to say, as mm -hmm. usual, you guys are having a really meaty discussion. I love this show. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your nice comments. Um, uh, you know, it's something that if, if I am not working, I cannot afford to miss. Uh -huh. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah. so, well, we appreciate that. Uh, one of the things I wanted to address is the subject that you brought up about, you know, the quotation from the Bible that there were giants in those days and mm -hmm. angels having sex with the daughters of men, so on. So well, that's forth, the right. implication anyway, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, that partially depends on, I suppose, the translation of the Bible, whether it's in the original or, or the Vulgate or the King James, because I don't know, having not read it in the original, but I do know that in the Vulgate, for instance, they make reference in the Bible to Lamias, and in the King James, that word is replaced with unicorns. Which is a completely different concept. Mm, yeah, okay. Um, That's interesting. Okay. For, for another, just from the religious perspective, even as far back as the Malleus Maleficarum, they had arguments against this particular idea. Hmm. Um, that, that, this, that it was, was angels? Is that what you're saying? With angels, they were using it because of the idea at that time with all the, the witchcraft scare and such uh, mm -hmm. of uh, incubi and succubi. They were saying that they basically were impossibilities because they would be spiritual beings. Spiritual beings do not have a physical nature, etc., etc., which is something you touched on earlier. Right. Yeah, but here you've got this tremendous amount of you know, biblical scholarship proving that point in, in that book. Um, so what do you think of the ICR's contention that it was all DNA modification by Satan and his henchmen? That one, <laughs> I, I kind of land squarely between the two of you on because one had said that the that, uh, seem to be almost a heresy, which incidentally, I think that heresy is called Manichaeanism. Manichaeanism. Manichaeanism, yeah. yeah. 
And uh, yet at the same time, I see your point that it isn't quite, but it seems to be to be strongly bordering on that. And again, that that's something that's frequently uh, refuted by various church fathers throughout history. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, we don't mean to imply that this uh, utter nonsense coming from the ICR website is is held by uh, most, uh, sensible, most sensible oh, Christians. No. Yeah, I mean, most Christians would probably read that and laugh as hard as we did. But also, uh. um, you know, to me it seems that just like any other mythology, that the Bible in, in that instance is referring to the same sorts of things that you have with various myths of gods having offspring from human uh, females, you know, whether it be uh, Zeus and Danae or whatever. Um, it just, the whole argument is so ridiculous, but it's, it keeps coming up over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. Um also, there were a couple of other things I just wanted to make a brief comment on, uh, one of which was the, the thing with Bob Jones University and some of the things with Moore. It seems to me, especially the case involving the homosexual mother, that both Bob Jones' attitudes where the, the division of races is concerned and his approach with uh, the homosexuality are as antiquated as witchcraft laws or those laws that supported slavery. Oh, I would tend to agree. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Mm-hmm. I'm, we're with you there. Um, <laughs> And the last thing is uh, just a point of reference. Um, actually, the, the Aryan concept uh, was originally a linguistic term that referred to uh, what is now known as the Indo-European languages, and it's because the... But Blavatsky adopted it for her uh, yes. philosophical, right, and yeah. she popularized it. But uh, uh, if I could quote from even the person, one of the, the original users of it, um, okay. he, had, he was one of the ones responsible by accident. He had, <laughs> At, uh, apparently, uh, in a careless moment, as it's put, M- Mueller alluded to the Aryan race. He later um, corrected himself, saying, quote, To me, an ethnologist who speaks of an Aryan race, Aryan blood, Aryan eyes and hair, is as great a sinner as a linguist who speaks of a dolicocephalic dictionary or a brachycephalic grammar. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Uh, if I say Aryans, I mean neither blood, nor bones, nor hair, nor culture. I mean simply those who speak of an Aryan language. Hmm, okay. Um, so well, this so obviously you're saying it's been misused. Oh, yeah, over, for yes. over a century now. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, what, what's the source of this? What are you reading from? Well, actually, I was quoting from uh, L. Sprague de Kemp's Lovecraft biography because he was addressing Lovecraft's Oh, Aryanism. okay, okay. Uh, but he has references in, and in there, and I could look it up in the notes and yeah. send that to so you. So the concept of the Aryan does predate to theosophy. Oh, yeah. Um, well, right. Uh, but, of course, you know, um, uh, Blavatsky came up with all of these really different, bizarre uh, ideas about the early history of the human race. Um, yeah, I think at one point we were all some kind of a spiritual telepathic jellyfish or something. Mm. Well, also, <laughs> she, she took a lot of her material that she used in her various books mm-hmm. straight from the Rig Veda. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, <laughs> you okay, know, yeah. Which is, is never acknowledged, uh, as it's been put, that you know, yeah. she basically ripped them off and, and never gave them even credit. Yeah. I want to, I, I, I do, I've always been meaning to do a lot more reading on her than I have. I mean, I have read some DeCamp, uh, I think it's uh, either Ancient Engineers or one of his other historical books mm-hmm. where he discusses her in great detail. And I, I've, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm really looking for a definitive work on uh, her uh, from a skeptical point of view, of course. Yes. So uh, maybe because I know that Theosophy is still a going concern. Oh yeah. A lot of areas. And so, uh, so I think that'd be interesting. Um, great. Well, um, anything else for us? No, I just wanted to share my thoughts. And again, I tell you, I really appreciate you guys. You, you. Are a definite lift in the week. Well, well we appreciate that very thanks. much. So, and uh, thanks a lot for your information. It was, it was. Uh, I took some notes, and I'm going to be looking into some more of this stuff. Okay. Thank you. Have a good one. Okay. Jerry's a well-rounded Renaissance man. Yes, he knows definitely. A bit about Boy, he's yeah, good. smarter than me. I'd be on the show instead of me. <laughs> Don't say that uh, too loud. Oh, oh, yeah. Powers that be may, uh, may well, deem that. That's right. Anyway, okay. Well, let's just keep the party hard. keep the party going, shall we? Cody, Cody on two is on two. Um, and have been waiting a while too, or sure. recent? Well, probably has. So we'll just be. Cody. Hello. Hi. You're on the air. How are Hi. you doing? I've been watching the show for a while, and I finally had something to call in about. So Great. Right. Thank you. Um, I wanted to talk about the seventy bits of information you were talking about All right. uh, from your debate. Okay. And uh, I'm a computer science student, and mm-hmm. have to do a lot of math. And there's. Uh, a proof that we have to do a lot, and 
uh, computer type classes, uh, recursive proof that I think would uh, be easy to understand a way to uh, argue against the 70 bits of information max. Okay. And um, basically the recursive proof goes th like this. You, uh, it's usually used on natural numbers, you know, one, two, three, and above. And you would prove f that for the case for number one, that something is true. And then if you show that from any case, you can get to the next higher case. If you can show that, then everything above that is true. So if you can get from step one to step two. And then two to three, three to four, two et cetera, to three, and Then all cases are true. Okay. So if you apply that to his... Um, it's a way to build information. 70 bits. I mean, can you show that there exists a case where there is one bit of information? Well, I, I'm guessing he would say that is true. But something exists well, that has one piece of information. Uh, you mean something goes that low? You mean something has one bit of information and then we work our way up to 70? Yes. Which was his argument. And then getting above 70, he claims that natural processes are insufficient to do that. That right, beyond but, that, it, it but don't even design. go that far to begin with for the yeah. case of the proof. Okay. Um, I would first ask, is, is there something that has one bit of information? Okay. And, and in other words, and let me see if I understand you correctly, under the recursive proof, if something is capable... Proof, proof, by, proof by induction. That's what it's called. Okay. There we go. That if, uh, you know, Our staff yeah. is on it. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you, are, you, are you suggesting that if you have an instance where you can, uh, you can uh, find something with one bit of information... And then from there, go to step two, step three, step four. Right. I guess and finding if anything one... in nature that could possibly add a bit of information. Okay. Then even, it, even randomly. Then it would go up beyond 70. Na just naturally. 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 Right. Mm, it and may be improbable, but possible. Yeah. But the probability factor goes down. But then again, when we're talking about, we're taking the entire universe into account, um, you know, the, the probability factors are, are not as impressive as he was trying to make them out to be. In other words, right? right? I mean, because when you're talking about an infinite potential number of events occurring, then even if you have a number like 3.3 .3 times 10 to the negative 141sts, that's not some insurmountable probabilistic sum, right? Right. Okay. Thank you. That's interesting. Okay. Recursive proof or, or, or proof, proof by induction. That's the proper name. I couldn't remember it offhand. Proof by induction. Well, thank you for that. That's very You're welcome, and uh, love the show. Keep doing a good job. We appreciate Thank it. Thanks, Thanks for the nice comments and the information. Okay, line two. two. Um, well, we just have a, 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 a this experience viewers are the best, man. I tell you, a lot we, of good good calls in. Okay. Um, well, we have Bobby on one, but I don't see a flashing green light on one, so I'm just going to go. Uh, what's up? What's happening with line one, guys? Because if I don't have anything happening with line one, I'm going to go to line three with Gabe. I'm going to line. Let's go to three. We'll, we'll go to we'll, three, we'll three and then we'll come back to one if we have some. We'll come back to one. All right, we'll do that. Hello, is this Gabe? Yeah, this is Gabe. Hi, you're on the air. How you doing? Um, I'm doing pretty good. Um, I'm probably going to ask a somewhat generic of a question, but um, sure. Um, I'm I'm kind of wondering about the ethics of atheism. Like, uh, like being an agnostic, I believe that God's given no proof to Himself on this planet. But I do believe that, that you know maybe it's just you know the romantic in me that wants to believe there is something up there watching us. But like, um, have, if I, if I ever was like completely sure there wasn't one, you know, and I may sound like a bad person for this, I wouldn't understand like why I would not steal when not noticed and wouldn't like, you know, victim of crime and stuff like that. Why I wouldn't be my kind of like a might make right kind of philosophy of life, you know, like, I mean, the things that keeps me from stealing from my friends and, uh, neighbors whatnot is the fact that I do believe in a kind of a you know a balance of what sort well and when without the balance I don't understand why I mean I, I just kind of want to know why you what what keeps you guys from doing the same thing okay well uh, first of all there are people that do exactly what you say you would do if you maybe thought that there was no being what uh, whatsoever watching you uh, and they're called criminals <laughs> and we mm -hmm. we try to catch them and punish them because we have a societal concept where we said we want the benefits of living in a society, and uh, I don't want my stuff taken, so I'm going to give that same benefit to my neighbor and not take their stuff. Uh, and and I, I like the benefits of living in the society that I live in, 
and I, uh, I mean, I, I don't need uh, an outside source to tell me not to take something that is not mine. Oh, granted, okay, yeah. well, thievery aside, how about, like, the ethics of, say, pornography and whatnot like that? I know, I mean, like, it should, like, uh, like the so-called, like, you know, like, the vices or whatnot, you yeah. know, like... Well, you know, we, we, we kind of touched on this a little bit last week, <clears throat> um, where uh, we were asked our opinion on various crimes that were maybe not necessarily the like harshest prostitution, yeah, and drugs, we, and things. Prostitution, drugs, and we went through and, and discussed. It's, it's, I think overall, you need to look at this thing in sort of a meta, you know, fashion. And overall, you, you always, no matter what it is you're going to be engaged in in life, you need to take into account that your actions, whatever they may be, are going to have consequences. And that, to me, seems to be a solid underlying principle for making the decisions that you make in life. Now, uh, if you were to uh, look at a situation like, uh, say, you're in a shop and contemplating, you know, slipping something under your jacket, then you would have to think of the consequences of those actions. Well, okay, um, if the, you know, potential guilt of just simply taking something that did not properly belong to you and, and could cause the retail establishments a financial loss, if that alone wasn't enough to persuade you, then you would have to look at other potential consequences. Well, maybe this has a little electronic alarm thingy on it that I can't see, and it'll go off, and I'll get arrested and go to jail, and it'll be all embarrassing, and then I'll have to, you know, do this time or pay these fines or what have you. Um... Now, for some people, just the, 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 the simple fact of, you know, I just oughtn't take this because, you know, this, the, the store has a financial stake in this product, and the, the, the reason this store is open is to sell me this product, uh, and, and that's how they make their money, which allows them to still be in business tomorrow so that I can come back here and shop again if I want to. So that alone is, I think for most people, a sufficient consequence that they would stay stealing merchandise from this company, even if there were no police for a billion miles, even if there were no security cameras, even if there were no, you know, guys waiting to tackle me in the parking lot, that alone is I, a sufficient okay. impetus to say, well, then I shouldn't damage the store in this way. So but, the, but as an intelligent thinker, I understand why you wouldn't do it. But would you like, as an atheist, would you like to like? Do you I'm sorry. Did we lose him? Uh, we hang on. We've. Uh, Hey, hang on, Cody. Hang on, Gabe. Gabe, I'm sorry. Hang on, Gabe. We've lost you on the speaker. We have no speaker suddenly in here. Control room. Oh. Okay, are okay. you there, Gabe? Hang on. They're mess They're doing something with the speaker. Uh, okay. Well, sorry. Anyway, I'll I'll go ahead and I'll try to answer. Do you want to answer him? Well, uh, I'm not sure where he was. He was he was getting ready to make a point. But I'm not sure where that was going. Well, uh, he I talked about the morality aspect uh, yeah. of vices, and uh, I'm not sure that was kind of open ended. I'm not yeah. really sure what. Gabe, are you there? I'm I'm still here. Okay, uh, okay we got your son. Go, we, we, go ahead and make your point real quickly. Oh, we have um, callers to get to. Okay. Well, as atheists, do you believe like? Uh, be, being, you, I, I would consider people like us a, a lot smarter than the masses. Well, I don't know about that, but I mean, I, I think we're certainly less inclined. We're, we certainly, or less, I like less, to think uh, that I'm less inclined to just believe unfounded supernatural claims, you know, at face value. Than okay. That. Well, yeah. Do, then you, do you believe religion has like a practical purpose in keeping uh, um, less scrupulous people from doing such things? I think like a god system is kind of good in a way that to keep uh, people. Is, I think I think some people need the threat of punishment to keep them from doing things, uh, and uh, you can't get much more threat of punishment than there's an, a, a big god watching over your shoulder for every right, every time you want to masturbate at night. Yeah. You know, it's on you know it's on the godly video. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, <laughs> oh, that's you know, and I wonder uh, if God stores those ugly visual. On, you know, nights when he's feeling no, lonely. no, but, T anyway, no, TMI to any, the horrible any, visual. Anyway, wants. what I'm saying <laughs> is that I think uh. that there are people that that need that and use that, and I think it it could be beneficial to them in in that uh, in that instance. But yeah. clearly, that we see those situations where that doesn't work right. because we have all of these people in the clergy who are you know facing accusations of child abuse. Certainly. Um, you know, again, not to say that they all are inclined to do that, but it does seem to be a disturbingly high number. I guess religion does kind of... Re I think that what religion does is, and this is what I found, is that it, it provides people with 
in the end, a justification to kind of go ahead and do what they were inclined to do in the first place. Now, that's not to say that all religious folks are motivated by these sneaky ulterior motives, um, but it does seem to me, for example, I'll just give it very quickly, but, and then we are going to have to go on to our last caller before we hang up. Um, there was a bit of a controversy and something of a moral outrage when after 10 days after the September 11th attack, um, this, uh, a, a Christian film called Megiddo mm. was released to, in the theaters, and this depicted Armageddon and the end of the world and the Antichrist and da-da-da-da, <laughs> and this was considered to be kind of in poor taste. And what was amusing to me was that the producer of the film, who was a guy named Matt Crouch, who was the son of Paul Crouch, who was the guy who runs Trinity yeah. Broadcasting Network, the greatest thing to happen to TV since porn, <laughs> okay, is... Um, Playing cheesy soundtrack. Well, he's... Uh, exactly. And special effects. Um, he's got the thing, bowls yeah. of fire coming That's out of right. it. Yeah. But he's got the... He, he, he went on, and, and his public uh, stance on this was, well, we all prayed, right, to see if this would be the right thing to do. You know, and well, voila, guess what God told us? He told us he wanted the movie to come out. (laughs) You know, it's it's all about, you know, uh, I think a lot of it is used uh, by people in a sense to justify whatever kind of they whatever kind of thing that they are more or less predisposed to do in the first place. You know, Uh, many people, you're right. I mean, I think the, the fear of some sort of divine wrath might keep from keep them from committing little petty crimes or not so petty crimes. That people who had common sense wouldn't do at all. But at the same time, who knows, you might get somebody saying something like, oh, well, I, you know, I beat this total stranger to death with a ball-peen hammer because I, lo- I heard demon voices coming from his head, and so I had to kill the demons. I mean, not a guy's lunatic, but I mean, it happens, okay? I mean, okay. so anyway. Um, yeah, and, and real quickly, just a, a point. Uh, it's it, a lot of the the Christians will say that you know morality is is objective. It's this way and this way, but it's quite arbitrary. And they they will switch. And I'll give you an example: Heather Mercer and I think Dana Curry, uh, the the two women that were working for the aid German aid organization that were arrested in Afghanistan. Oh, the ones who were arrested for proselytizing. Yes, they before they ever went to Afghanistan, they worked for a German aid organization. I believe it was. They had to sign a statement saying, I will not proselytize. We're there to provide aid, and that's it. They then went over there and admit to proselytizing. They outright lied. Now they're considered heroes and martyrs with an end justifies the means attitude. So they can put away their Christian morality that says don't lie when it comes to furthering their religion. Well, but because, so, well, Paul advocates that. Right, yeah. Paul like, so, like a Second Corinthians, yeah. And stuff like that. Right, so, I mean, you know, you've got to look at it from this. It, 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 you know, it comes down to an individual basis. Some people need certain things and others don't. Yeah. And uh, I, mean, I think that religion can be beneficial to certain types of people and harmful to certain types of people. Yeah. yeah. That's, um, yeah, okay. Well, and uh, one last thing. Okay. Um, if, uh, if, if, I mean, considering... Uh, the fact if there was to be some sort of God, which I know you seem incredulous, and I, I don't think he he would be uh, mad at the at the line of thought that you guys go about. But would it be uh, would it be nice to believe that uh, there was something after this? Well, well, you know, I'm sorry, you go ahead. I don't, I don't want to cut you off, but I'm sure it'd be nice to believe in all kinds of great, you know, yeah. cool things. Yeah. I'd love, I'd love. I don't want to die. It scares the hell out of me. Yeah. <laughs> all yeah. I know is living. I don't want to die. You know. Yeah. Uh, but but I can't toss my mind out uh, out the window and say I think that something that is this highly improbable is true uh, it, it, it you know it's pie in the sky fantasy and instead I think it, it makes me value my current life uh, much more yeah. I guess it all boils down to what Im- how important the concept of intellectual integrity and honesty is to you you know um, and uh, let me put it this way: If if you believe, if you if you accept the view that it is okay to believe falsehoods simply because it provides you with uh, some form of emotional satisfaction or just happiness, then my concern is: What value does the truth have? True. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, Thank thanks a lot. lot. We gotta let you go. We got uh, five minutes. Five minutes and two callers. So uh, we're gonna, well, we'll try to get to them both. So yeah. um, otherwise. Uh, folks, I know we were late in starting on the calls today, but the debate was uh, an unusual thing that we needed uh, a little extra time to discuss. 
So uh, we'll just go to Bobby on one. Bobby? Hey, guys. Thanks hey. for holding. Sorry, okay. sorry we're rushing you here. That's okay. I, I, I was supposed to be on earlier, but uh, I got a call to come in. I had to hang up. Sorry. Okay. okay. We're but, um, What's up? Anyway, uh, I was wanting to talk about uh, David, the first guy who called in. Um, okay. Uh, uh, the watchmaker theory? Yeah, that, that guy, yeah. Whatever. It wasn't a watchmaker. It was a hard drawn in the sand theory. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I have ne I've never heard of that, that concept before. Okay. And, um, uh, just quickly, it was an argument for, um, for uh, a, a creator or a designer that was put forth in 1802 by a theologian named William Paley. And you can read about it on our website at uh, that, at, uh, there you go, atheist-community.org slash fact. .htm, and there is also a very good uh, um, uh, website called the Skeptics Dictionary, which, uh, can we put the other website uh, listings up on the uh, screen? Russell, thank you. It, which is at skepdic, S-K-E-P-D-I-C dot com, right there, which also has a more detailed listing yeah. on intelligent design. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, um, you know, I, I believe in God. Um, I'll go ahead and say that up front. And, and my friends tell me that my religious beliefs are sometimes extreme and absurd. But, um, well. uh, you know, when it comes to order and design, I believe everything that happens, whether it's good or bad, is, you know, a divinely inspired experience. You know, because we are created, my belief, that we are created in the image of God, then everything we do, it doesn't matter if it's good or bad, is... An is, aspect of God. Right. Yeah. Right. That's, that's what I believe. And, and that's why I think when it comes to order and design, that everything is created in order and design. Right. Well, and, and that's I, I would just cannot, have... That's, that's maybe why David could yeah. not, d you know, define disorder. Yeah. You wouldn't have to be a Calvinist by any chance, would you? No, I don't think so. Okay. Because that is sort of a, the, the way Calvinists think about things. Um... You might I want to check into that. Yeah, I'll yeah, have. Like I'll just. I'll just. I'll just give you a couple quick answers, and okay. then we do want to go to our last caller who's okay. waiting. Um, that is, there. There is a distinction to be made uh, between order and design. I do not have time to get into that distinction, but what I'll do is I'll make a note and I will address it at the beginning of next week's program if you have a chance to watch us. Yeah, I will. Um, order and design. Um, I'll go in and I'll read from some sources that I have, and then you can respond to that if you like. Okay. Uh, secondly. Um, you know, it's uh, what a person believes that gives them satisfaction in life is, of course, their business and their right and their prerogative and all that sort of stuff. I think, though, that when what is going on in the intelligent design versus evolution debates is that religion is attempting to sort of cross this boundary by saying we're now no longer a matter simply of belief. We can prove our claims in a scientific sort of empirical sense. At that point, those beliefs then... Uh, if that's how they want them, if they want them treated as scientific hypotheses, then they need to be prepared to sort of obey the same rules that uh, science applies pretty much across the board. Mm -hmm. And that's so that's kind of but but call us next week. OK, because okay. we're kind of running out of time. OK, thanks. thanks for waiting. OK, okay right. Doc. take care. OK, I don't. Yeah, we'll try it. We'll try it. Charles. Yeah. Hi. Thanks for holding. Sorry. We're at the end of the show. One question. Sure. Um, do, uh, I've never asked this of an atheist. Uh, mm -hmm. And you just reminded me of this guy talking about ethics, reminded me that I wrestled with this question years ago. Do you have a concept or a true belief in good and bad? Um, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, talk about that in our last uh, minute and a half. Thank you. Do you uh, David? Um, I, I would say that uh, a true belief in good and bad is in an objective standard of good and bad. I would say no. Yeah, uh, I would say. I, I mean, would, uh, yeah. I think that I think that um, morality is subjective. Well, I think that it boils but down to that could be misconstrued. Yeah, I again, I again fall back on. It's not is is your system of morality based upon rules, which are like just its viable list of A B C D do this don't do that, or are you basing your uh, system of morality and ethics upon principles? And I think principles are stronger because. They apply in a broader sense. And a great principle that I like to use is actions have consequences and think about your consequences before you act. That's how I would reply to that. And, and I, I go with the uh, do what you will as long as you don't harm the person or property of another. Yeah. And then if everybody does that, then I'm good. Did you write a little heart on the beach for me? You dick I, well, Oh, shucks. I oh, okay. All right. Hey, there's our love rings going out to Austin. Thank you. We love you. We appreciate everyone calling. 
Uh, more phone calls next week. Uh, thanks again. Thank you, David. Christians, remember, we don't hate you. We, we just, just think, think you're, you're wrong. wrong. We'll see you next week, 4.30.